the presentation of anarchism, anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Flame of the Red Flag Reflections on Ecology, Social Cognition, and the Paris Commune by Alexander Aston. 150 years ago, working-class Parisians rose up in Europe's largest urban insurrection of the 19th century. For nearly three months, Paris was organized and operated through an alternative municipal infrastructure that had begun to emerge during the four-month Prussian siege of the previous autumn and winter. A diverse array of organizations and networks that included neighborhood associations, citizens' militias, women's unions, worker cooperatives, municipal assemblies, and radical clubs all helped to organize Paris from the bottom up. The Commune produced and distributed goods through mutual aid groups and collectivized factories, established schools, medical facilities, and newspapers, minted coins, and held highly democratic elections with full political rights for women. A radically new form of municipal organization and governance in a European context was created and sustained until its brutal suppression by the national government. The Commune is a robust example of what systems theorists describe as emergent complexity, a novel pattern of organization that developed through a variety of decentralized, autonomous interactions and relationships. It is difficult to overstate the impact of the Commune on the left's conceptual frameworks, narratives, and symbolism. Marx's reporting and analysis of the events propelled him and his theories to new prominence. Divergent interpretations of the Commune's events played no small role in the split between the socialists and the anarchists of the Second Internationale. There is hardly a major radical figure of the late 19th and early 20th century that did not provide some written reflection on the Commune. The events of 1871 assumed a sacred, mythic place within the culture of the left. So much so that nearly a century later, the Soviets sent part of a communard flag into space with the Voskhod I. However, the purpose of this essay is not to relitigate the discourses and debates surrounding this history. Rather, the goal is to reconsider the commune from a perspective of anti-Cartesian process anarchism and what the interdependence of mind, culture, and environment tells us about strategies for social transformation in the 21st century. The other purpose of this article is to pay homage to a specific group of our ancestors that undertook an enormous effort and paid a terrible price trying to create a more just world. The commune ended with the massacre of possibly as many as 30,000 men, women, and children, with roughly 5,000 more people imprisoned and deported. In the National Archives, one can find images of children no more than six or seven years old that were killed by the National Assembly and the French Army. They deserved better. The Prussian military laid siege to Paris on the 19th of September 1870, having routed the armies of Napoleon III in little over a month. Over a million and a half Parisians and French soldiers were trapped and cut off from the outside world. Over the course of four months, the city of light went dark. Avenues and parks were denuded of trees and sewers scoured for rats. The Prussian encirclement formed an ecological bottleneck that drastically transformed the flow of energy and matter within Paris and reconfigured institutional dynamics. During this period, the Volunteer National Guard became the single largest source of employment for the working class, paying one and a half francs a day. However, by mid-November, a single egg could cost as much as a single franc. The divisions between the classes became extreme. The wealthy were able to cope with the price inflation, and as the situation became more desperate, they eventually purchased and consumed the animals in the Parisian zoo. Meanwhile, the poor were forced to eat whatever they could manage to acquire, from mice to sawdust. 
Towards the end of the siege, nearly 5,000 people were dying a week, mostly the elderly, the young, and the poor. Across the city during this period, a multitude of radicalized groups, both pre-existing and newly formed, were consolidating. Some of the earliest brazen radical actions were the formations of vigilance committees that would engage in revolutionary requisitioning by targeting shops suspected of price gouging. The seized food would then be distributed within neighborhood networks. The National Guard, comprised of volunteer neighborhood militias that elected their own officers, developed into a critical organizing network that co coordinated groups across the city. Radicalized networks began to expand and intersect within working class communities as the effects of the siege transformed ecological relationships throughout the city. The winter of 1870 was one of the coldest in recorded history, drastically increasing the energetic stresses created by the Prussian encirclement. By the end of the siege, many Parisian boulevards and parks had been denuded of trees as large groups of the freezing poor swarmed bourgeois areas to chop down green firewood. The city's theatres were shut towards the end of November due to lack of fuel. The playhouses not only had been the major source of entertainment and distraction from the siege, but also spaces of warmth for the public. As it became increasingly difficult to heat large institutional sites of congregation, such as theatres and churches, people were increasingly drawn into more radical environments. The various radical clubs that emerged around the city became locations in which it was possible to stay warm, potentially find food, and be exposed to revolutionary discourse. In short, transformations in the energy matter flows of Paris's urban system triggered institutional reconfigurations that supported the growth of and reliance upon radical organizations in the city. Smaller, more efficient forms of organization which were able to cope with the demands and stresses of the siege through mutual aid also began to transform collective narratives and behaviors. The siege of Paris ended on January 28th with the capitulation of the French government. Over the course of the following 49 days, tensions between the French National Assembly and an increasingly radicalized and assertive Parisian working class rapidly intensified. At the core of the escalating conflict were hundreds of antiquated bronze muzzle-loading cannons that had been paid for by public subscription during the siege. The Central Committee of the National Guard had moved the artillery to a number of working-class neighborhoods, whilst the National Assembly was determined to assert its authority and reclaim the weaponry. In short, the cannons had become the preeminent signs of power between two divergent forms of authority. Yet, perhaps even more importantly, the cannons were literally cast from household goods and materials that had been sourced by communities and melted down. People's cutlery, candlesticks, cookware, and more had been transformed into the cannons. These material relationships substantiated the sense of ownership over the artillery. Personal possessions, community identities, anger over the deprivations and humiliations of the siege, distrust of the ruling class, the power to assert demands, and an emergent political imagination were all entangled in the form of the cannons. That is to say, the artillery anchored the collective attention of working class Parisians as a concrete manifestation of collective value, identity, and power. In the early morning of March the 18th, the military was deployed to seize the cannons from the National Guard. On the Butte of Montmartre, the plan faltered. A National Guardsman was shot, and the horses needed to remove the artillery did not appear. Soon, the alarm was raised, and the people of Montmartre poured out en masse to surround the soldiers. It was an immensely chaotic moment, with bells ringing, people jostling and shouting, women draping themselves over the cannons to prevent their removal, while armed National Guardsmen milled amongst the crowd. As the standoff intensified, the general overseeing the operation ordered his troops to fire multiple times. Rather than shoot into the crowd, a soldier reversed his rifle so that the stock was pointed towards the sky. Then another, and another, and another, 
until a forest of upturned rifles signaled the unwillingness of the soldiers to fire on the crowd. The upturned weaponry provided clear signs that rapidly and collectively communicated the soldiers' atten intentions amidst an incredibly tense, noisy, and unruly confrontation. The crowd surged forward and embraced the mutinous soldiers, catalyzing a revolutionary insurrection that cascaded from the heights of Montmartre and was in full control of the city by the afternoon. The cannons and the rifles are just one example of the incredibly important role of material culture in mediating the dynamics of the commune. Throughout the political experiment, communards extensively modified themselves and the Parisian environment. Individuals expressed radical identity and revolutionary intent through clothing such as red liberty caps, as well as adorning various ribbons and other paraphernalia to their persons and weaponry. The red flag was raised across the city and made readily perceptible the social geography of insurrection. Barricades both altered movement and social interaction as well as immunitized the memory and narratives of revolutionary Paris. Likewise, the transformation of churches into radical meeting halls substantiated both a new social imagination and social order. The public burning of a guillotine and the toppling of the Vendôme column symbol of Napoleonic imperialism, were both a repudiation of the values they embodied, as well as proclamations of a distinct social-political identity. Artifacts and the built environment anchored collective attention, facilitated shared understanding, and coordinated collective actions. The physical transformation of Paris did not merely represent or communicate information, it constituted the revolutionary moment as an emergent reality full of possibilities. There are numerous reasons, extensive analysis, and debates about the commune's failure that I will not detail here. Certainly there were strategic and tactical errors, as well as serious breakdowns in the effective coordination of action. Perhaps the greatest failure was the desire to negotiate in good faith with a political adversary that was only truly interested in dominance and power. Certainly, ultimate blame must rest on the shoulders of Adolf Thiers and the national government for its commitment to ruthless violence and absolute control. It is not my purpose here to dwell on that tragedy. There are a great many lessons to be gained from the Commune, which have profound implications for the 21st century and radical transformation. The Commune demonstrates how the development of anti-Cartesian process anarchisms can inform theories of political change. Effective strategies for robust, sustained social transformation need to break down analytical dichotomies of mind, matter, nature, and culture. Social organization is an emergent property of energy matter flows within an entanglement of brains, bodies, and material environments. Altering or reconfiguring flows of energy and matter in human relationships will generate structural changes in the organization of communities. This is deeply apparent in the effects of the Prussian siege. The energy bottleneck shut down the major institutions such as large churches and theaters, while the physiological need for food and fuel motivated enrollment in the National Guard, attendance to radical clubs, participation in vigilance committees, and other radical actions. It was the smaller, more efficient, and dedicated radical organizations that were best able to step into the vacuum to provide resources, narratives, and collective agency in support of the dispossessed. The flourishing of the commune in the wake of this destruction is not so different from dynamics of ecological succession or adaptive radiations following extinctions. The relevance of these aspects of the commune should be clear for the 21st century. We live in a world of cascading economic, political, and ecological systems failure. The commune provides a number of insights for the contemporary moment. First, effective strategy should identify the organization of energy matter flows in any political economy. Ultimately, power is the expression of energetic capacity and it is necessary to identify and restructure how matter and energy flows through a system in order to sustain counter power. Second, political economies are economies of attention. 
who and what we pay attention to shape our shared narratives, concepts of value, and capacities for collective action. Importantly, material culture plays a central role in the creation of shared understandings that coordinates activity without the need for direct communication. The greater the ability to generate collective attention and meaning amidst the diversity of human perspectives, the greater the ability to coordinate and sustain collective challenges to existing power structures. There are many parallels in the current moment. The pandemic, over a decade of economic crisis and drastic ecological changes are reconfiguring the flow of energy and matter in the global system. Already, decades of community organizing are helping to fill the void of a dysfunctional politics. Systemic injustice and new forms of material culture such as social media have crystallized shared attention, values, and narratives to trigger collective action. Such moments are when it is necessary to expand and develop radical infrastructure to provide energetic resilience and emergent possibilities. Every union, arts collective, mutual aid group, free school, community center, local cooperative, DIY space, and more provide the essential matrix through which new systems can emerge, grow, and transform. Consider the walls of Paris like the mineral membrane of a cell. Within the city, matter and energy intersect in a continuously generative process, flowing into various configurations of persons and materials eddies form in cafes and print shops, churning through homes, militias, government offices, radical clubs, and workers' cooperatives. Powerful flows of energy and matter carve the channels of history. Barricades emerge, and great currents sweep them away. Bones become sediment. Through the months of the siege and commune of Paris, the organization and relationships of communities radically transformed. These ecological relationships were mediated through people, neighborhoods, cannons, barricades, flags, food, and fuel. The commune ignited from the materials of the city like a wildfire, profoundly altering the course of history before its flame was suppressed, but not extinguished. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.